So welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. We started our section on interest rates. So we are here in the section on interest rate structures with a small introduction. And then we moved to yeah, a collection of definitions. We defined the zero bond and based on the zero bond, all kinds of interest rates. And today I would like to continue and conclude this session with maybe an important rate, the backward looking rate, which has gained importance recently. So I will complete here this section. But uh, before I do this, uh, maybe I give a short recap of what we have done so far. So there was the definition of the zero coupon bond. Sometimes I just call it the bond. So it is the guaranteed payment of one unit of currency at a future point in time. Yeah, so this is my P and it depends on the maturity T2. Yeah, and in T2, I receive one unit of currency and I ask myself, okay, what is the value at an earlier point in time? So say, for example, what is the value here in little t? So this P of T2 is a stochastic process. If I evaluate it in little t, it is a random variable. And based on this, we defined different versions, yeah, different conventions uh, of interest rates. So there was the forward rate, which is just here the ratio of two such zero copper bonds for different times. So you see on the slides, there is no little t. So everything can be observed in a point, say little t here. So everything is observed maybe in this point. And then you just check for two different maturities. Okay, how much do you gain over this period here? And you express that then in terms of this quantity, L1 plus L times period length. So it is scaled, it is a rate, it is per time uh, scaled to the period length. We could also, uh, look at what happens if we consider the same situation, but we let the period lengths. So say here our T1 to T2, we let it shrink to an infinitesimal period length. So this is then an infinitesimal period length and that gives us here the instantaneous forward rate F, the interest rate for an infinitesimal small period in the future observed in some point little t here. Then we could move the capital T, so this guy here, to our observation point. Say this is here our little t, the point at which we observe the quantity. And this is then the short rate. It is the instantaneous forward rate for the period that it's just starting now. So that was then the short rate. Short rate is our rate R here, the instantaneous forward rate for the period that just starts now. I defined it here in terms of this R, which I do not have on the slides, but you can also define it in terms of the L or the F. So actually R of T is, maybe just have it here. R of T is just the F of T, T. We also define a kind of a financial product now based on our interest rates or based of our, uh, on our collection of uh, zero copper bonds. That was the rolling bond. So there is a time discretization, which I call tenure discretization because it is discretizing the interest rate periods. And on this discretization, 
I do now a repeated reinvestment in the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the next period. So there is this object here, which is the zero copper bond that I observe at a time little t. So maybe here is my time little t. Okay, and then you see there is this quantity m of little t plus one. So it's the index of the end of the period where I'm in. So you see this is my m of t, it's the starting point. m of t plus one is the end point. So this guy here is the t m of t plus one. So I'm invested in the zero copper bond that matures here. And what you have here on the right side, this product is the stuff that has been accumulated yeah, during this strategy of repeated reinvestments. So this is the stuff that has been accumulated. And actually since the bond is one at the end, but you would start with the one in the beginning, you also have this additional period here in this product. So the product is what you accumulate until you reach the end, huh? because then at the end, this guy here is equal to one and you just have what you accumulate. So you start by say investing one unit here and you accumulate. So a little bit the opposite to the starting point, our zero copper bond, what is the value of one unit in the future today? We start with one unit today and we look how is the value accumulating by repeatedly reinvestment, uh, reinvesting in zero copper bonds on this time discretization. This guy will be yeah, important now for our next definition. Before I come to this, let me finish our small recapitulation. We then mentioned that all these interest rates are maybe good objects to build models. Yeah? So they are our model primitives. Well, the zero copper bond is a nice object to start off because it is yeah, in its definition so simple. There's just a single parameter very simple definition, but all these guys are somewhat coupled because the time spans are overlapping. And here in the interest rates, it looks a little bit as if we have created some kind of decoupling um, of the relevant quantities. Yeah. Also later, we will maybe see that's always from a numerical approach, it's always better to model differential quantities and integrate later then to model an integrated quantity. So a quantity that is a sum of something and then differentiate yeah, because differentiating is numerically not so robust as integrating. So the interest rates are um, maybe good starting points to build models and based on which interest rate you use now, you have different models. There is, for example, here our forward rate, which I denote with L. Capital F would also be a nice letter, but L may be for historic reasons because it is for historic reasons called often LIBOR rate. Yeah. It is a discrete term structure model that we obtain then because it is a discretization of the interest rate curve. We could also write down the E2 processes for F, F of dot, capital T, yeah? so for every maturity I have an E2 process, this is then the HGM framework. Very nice to study analytically some properties, or we could use the short rate, which is just a single point, and we just model the short rate. There was the puzzling thing that how can it be that modeling a single point, namely just the interest rate for the next period, is enough to describe everything? And it is not enough. It is enough only under a certain condition. So here, these two guys describe all zero copper bonds. Well, not precisely. This guy describes all zero copper bonds. 
this guy describes all zero copper points on my time discretization. But since we have to discretize in the computer anyway, that's just the maybe a minor difference between the two. But this here describes only a single rate. And we could then recover the zero copper bonds from our interest rates. We could do this for the instantaneous forward rate, the continuous guy, or for the discrete, the simple forward rate. So we could do this then on the time discretization. Okay. But we could also do it and recover all bond prices from the short rate by this little observation that if we know the short rate process under the equivalent Martingale measure, QN, then if we know the short rate process under QN, we could just use it and define the numeraire using the short rate by repeatedly reinvesting in infinitesimal small periods. So this is infinitesimal small rolling the bond. And then of course you can value all zero copper bonds because you have a valuation measure and a numeraire. So there is this little special trick to recover all zero copper bond prices from the short rate. And I also mentioned that this is a special situation, and this is then the reason why I do not like it for didactical reasons to start with short rate models, because they are a little bit special. And for that reason, we will start with modeling the forward rate. We concluded our last session with this very nice picture. And since I will pick this picture up, after I have defined the backward rate, let's have again, a look at this picture. So these are now the three important guys we have defined. There is the instantaneous forward rate. So I'm currently here in my time t equals zero. So we observe everything in little t equals zero. All the guys are stochastic processes. So we can expect that here, the green guys, they will move up or down yeah, when the time will pass on. Okay, so when the time passes on, everything starts moving here. But um, a static view, we have the instantaneous forward rate. This is for every future maturity. I have the interest rate for an infinitesimal small period. I have the discrete, the simple forward rate. So the simple forward rate is then just the discretization. And we already saw that it is a kind of average of the blue curve. Yeah. So for that reason, here it is a little bit above, here it is a little bit below. Yeah. It is an average. Well, it is an average in a certain sense. Yeah, it is one plus L times delta T is exponential integral F. But if the exponential function is approximated by one plus X, you see the one is canceling, you divide by the delta T and you have L is one divided by delta T integral F. Yeah, So it is, it is the average apart from this thing that there's the exponential function involved. And we have the short rate sitting here, which is the starting point of the curve F. So now if time evolves, all these guys start moving. So we have a stochastic process. For example, the short rate will move along the blue curve. So the drift of the short rate follows the blue curve. You can also prove this. Uh, apart from some terms which come from the probability measure and the, the sigma, um, so the volatility. And there is some kind of random movement around this. And you already see that there is then the result at a future point in time, say here at t equals two, then you could just take the expectation here 
of this, yeah? so conditional expectation to recover this point. So there is the relation that you can also recover then F and then you can recover all zero couple point prices. But also the other guys will move. Uh, they are also stochastic processes. So the whole blue curve moves or the green discretized curve move. So for example, everything goes down. That means if you then think in terms of measurability, yeah, so now I'm F T equals two measurable. So F two measurable. So this here is now your past. So it means that you know what has realized in the past and this year will become then your new future. So you are conditional now to this point that you know you have reached this point. So it means if you go back to the previous picture that this path here has realized itself, okay? So this is the guy that has realized itself and now the game continues. And again, if you now take the conditional expectation of the short rate, say for example, conditional to this starting point, you can derive again the uh, shape, recover the shape of the of the blue curves. So that was the end of our last session. And maybe we have now a very nice intuition on how these guys relate. Uh, in the lecture, I will focus on modeling the blue curve and the green curve. But since we will move to the computer and in the computer discretized interest rate model, we could immediately start modeling the green forward rates. Well, the green forward rates are sometimes for historical reason called LIBOR rates because the LIBOR London Interbank offer rate was following more or less this convention yeah, of being a rate for a fixed time period, three months, six months. yeah, And you could then also define financial product on this. But this rate has been abandoned and B has been replaced by well, something that is called backward looking rate. So let's define this. In my small recap, yeah, I also had the rolling bond on the slides. So you recall the rolling bond that was here our def definition 148. So the rolling bond was the repeated reinvestment in the bond that matures at the end of the period. And what you have here on the right hand side is the accumulated amount that has been accrued over these times. So the bond, um, the rolling bond here depends on a time discretization. So we have here our tenor discretization. And yeah, maybe I explain this also later again, you see that I sometimes have a specific notation here. So I use here a semicolon, right? And that means the arguments that stand before are just properties of the object, like in an object-oriented programming language. And my object is a stochastic process. So what comes here after is the observation time when I observe the stochastic process. And sometimes I leave it out, then it's just the stochastic process. Otherwise it's a random variable. Or sometimes I also add the omega here. Uh, so we have of T, and omega, yeah. so then you have the value, then I'm evaluating the random variable. So now this R has a property, uh, namely it depends on this time discretization, but sometimes uh, when its context is clear, I leave this out, so I just write here R of T. Okay, so I had this already, this little picture here. So what we have here is we start say with, one unit of currency. So there's a one here. Okay, and then we have a time discretization, our tenor discretization. So there's here T1, T2, 
T3 and so on. And we do repeated reinvestments, yeah? So that is, okay, if, it, if we start by investing, maybe the arrow should go down. So I invest one unit. So this means I get something back here, maybe something in excess. And then I do a reinvestment. I invest it again and I get something back and I get something more and more, yeah? Okay, so this looks like that. And this here is our R. Well, uh, I also have the R in between because in between it is the value of this zero copper bond. So now I can ask for the interest rate that I observe here along this line. So I could ask, what is the interest rate I observe from here, yeah, investing one unit to say, for example, this point here. So if I start say in S and I look then at how much do I have in T? Well, then I'm interested in the performance. I have started say with R of S. So R of S is my starting value. And I finally obtained here in capital T, the value R of capital T. So then I look at R of capital T divided by R of S. Minus one is what I have received in excess. Yeah? percentage divided by time makes the whole thing then a rate. So I have my object, say, let's call it I of S semicolon T because I observe it in capital T. And this guy I define as the performance rate of my accrual account R. So now you see that it's also an interest rate, but I'm going forward in time. And then I look backward, yeah? How much interest do I have accumulated? Right? So it is a backward looking rate because I observe in T, what do I have accumulated for interest since S? So it is a backward looking rate. So if I take S um, fixed yeah, as say a property of this object and actually to be precise, also the time discretization is a property of the object. So all this stuff should be here in front. Yeah, It should be I of S, my starting point and the whole time discretization. Then I can view this as a stochastic process in the time parameter capital T, and for that reason, I write I of S semicolon capital T. So this is our backward looking rate, yeah, in the sense that we determine the interest at the end of the period. So while for the forward rate, we have that we know the forward rate at the beginning of the period, yeah, it is F as measurable, the forward rate L for the period S T observed at the beginning of the period S, yeah, of course, observed at the beginning of the period, it is F as measurable. Now our guy is a rate that is F T measurable, but not necessarily F S measurable. Well, actually it is F T K minus one measurable because you have forward rates here inside, right? And the forward rates are always fixed at the beginning of the period, yeah? So you fix the forward rate at the beginning of the period, you know where you end up, yeah? So because when you end, when you reach the end of the period, this object here is one, and what you have is you have agreed on this, this, this rate. Okay, so you are, FT K measurable, yeah? So you are measurable one period before the end of the old stuff. So this is a backward looking rate and you know the rate not at the beginning of the period, but at the end of the period. Both rates uh, here in my notation apply to the same 
period from S to T. And for the special case that your time discretization is just one period, of course, the two things agree. Yeah, then it's just the investment over this period. And now there's an important, nice little lemma uh, that I would like to discuss. If we could choose our zero copper bonds as no matter, or maybe even simpler, if we could choose our rolling bond reinvestment as no matter, which is a consequence, if we can choose all zero copper bonds as no matter, then we have that the time S value. So observing at time S or at any early, earlier time of paying this backward rate at the time capital T, so at the end of the period, this is independent of this time discretization. So this is independent of the tenor discretization used. And in particular, since I could just use a time discretization that consists of one period, this means also that the time S value, so observing the payment at the beginning of the period of paying this backward rate in capital T, this agrees with the time S value of paying the forward rate. L in capital T. So let me draw a small picture. I have here my S, the starting of the period, here my T. Yeah? So you have your forward rate L. So that was the dark blue guy. This is your forward rate L. So you pay at the end of the period. So maybe there's some payment here. You could also look at the backward rate. Okay, and sometimes you pay more, sometimes you pay less. Okay, but um, the time S value, so the evaluation, so the conditional expectation of the two agrees. Yeah? Or, more generally, it does not depend on this time discretization here. Okay, so this is an important little lemma because it means that you can replace the I with an L if you just consider a linear function, which you would like to value at an earlier point of time, yeah? because expectation of the linear function is the linear function of the expectation. And now I have here that the expectation decrease. So the lemma depends on the requirement that I can choose my zero copper bond as no matter. This may be relevant in some situations. And let's have a look at the proof. Okay, that's simple. I have the assumption that I can choose all the zero copper bonds as no mareas. So this means I can switch from one zero copper bond as a no marea to the next one when I roll over this time period. So that means I can use my reinvestment strategy. I can use my R as a no marea. So I can choose R as a no marea. The claim is that the time S value does not depend on this time discretization. So I have here my tenor discretization, and now I look at the time S value. So the time S value means that I have conditional FS. So I'm a condition to the information I have in S. So I'm looking at the time S value and I apply the universal valuation theorem, the pricing theorem. So paying this here, paying this guy here in capital T. So I'm paying in capital T. 
So this means I divide by the numeraire n of capital T. So this amount paying in capital T, yeah, which means divide by the numeraire, evaluated in time S means conditional expectation of the numeraire relative value with respect to Fs multiplied with the numeraire in the evaluation time. This is just the universal evaluation theory. Okay, so now I choose as numeraire my accrual account R. So I can choose R as numeraire. So this will be an R, this will be an R because of this choice. And now I just plug in the definition. Well, my I is the performance yeah, rate associated with this R. So it is R the, at the end point divided by R at the starting point. Yeah? So this guy here is R at the end point divided by R at the starting point minus one. Okay, so that is the excess amount relative to the starting value I have, I get divided by the period length to make it a, a rate. So that is my definition. Um, you see that you can write this as R of T divided by R of S divided by R of T, which gives you a one divided by R of S. Okay, so this guy and this guy cancels. And of course, this here is just a one divided by R of T, both divided by the length of the time interval. Okay, you also see it looks like a finite difference, yeah? like a differentiation. Again, our interest rates are like differentiating the, the values. Um, yeah, what's that? Okay, so you, you can move this guy here in front. And this here is now the valuation of a zero copper bond with respect to the numeraire. So we see that this first guy here is just equal to one. And the second guy is just a zero copper bond, so one unit received in capital T, evaluated in S. So this is just the zero copper bond, P of capital T observed in S. Okay, so this is this guy here. Yeah, and if you have the definition of the L in mind, it is the zero core bond at the beginning minus the zero core bond at the end, yeah, observed in S, um, divided by the zero core bond that pays at the end, observed in S. So you arrive that this will get you L times P. So evaluating. Paying I at the end of the period is the same as evaluating L at paying L at the end of the period. Okay, this is a nice and helpful little lemma. So this is important if we will consider products like floaters or swaps, yeah, which are linear functions, usually linear functions of the forward rate, because then we can just replace in all these products, the forward rate L with the performance index I, and the valuation of the product is the same, yeah? as long as we are before the beginning of the period, yeah? on or before the beginning of the period, the valuation is the same. Before I was here at the lemma, I skipped one slide. Yeah, that was this remark. Um, a very common, very important application is the case where you have for this time discretization, you have a daily accrual. So this looks like that, that you could, for example, have here periods which are of three months, yeah, every three months, but in between you have a very fine 
daily, yeah, business day, daily accrual of this, of, of a one day forward rate, of a one day interest rate to construct then this backward looking rate. Yeah? So this is your um, I of S T yeah? from S to T for a very fine period. And this is maybe then now the interesting aspect to what's going on in the industry. This is a replacement for the three months. Yeah. So for example, if this year is three months, then this is a replacement for the three months forward rate. So this would be the period for the forward rate. This is a replacement for the three months forward rate. If you use here one day interest rates, accumulate the amount and calculate the rate backward looking. Yeah, what is the interest you you um, accumulated? Why is this a good definition? It now means that all the different periods here, say a six months rate. a 12 months rate, a three months rate, all these different periods, they rely on a single object that creates them. And that was an issue yeah, in the financial markets before, when you rely on forward rates, you have to determine the forward rates for three months, for six months, yeah, on the day at which we observe them. For example, say this here is my observation time, yeah, say by little t. Yeah. So now I, now I have to define what is the three months rate, what is the six months rate looking forward. So there were different quotations on the market and these quotations were coming from banks and maybe there was not so much liquidity in a certain yeah, uh, period length. So there was, yeah, really, um, a large number of different financial products that created different interest rates. Now all these interest rates looking backward are created by a single one. There's only the one day interest rate here that creates now the rate for the three months period, but we need to look backward. An example in the Eurozone for this one day interest rate is the European short-term rate sometimes also called ESTA, Euro STR. And um, you see here that it is published on each target two business day. Yeah? So it is an interest rate for a time discretization that relies on business days. Yeah? And all the financial products now reference this to construct the corresponding backward looking rate, which is then paid on a coarser time discretization. So for, for example, every three months, I pay you the amount, the interest accumulated by accruing, accumulating the short term rate. So you do not find this maybe in textbooks, yeah, that were written some years ago, maybe before say 2020 or whatever, uh, it's difficult to find this because this switch to referencing backward rates built on such a short-term rate, uh, this, this came uh, up only recently. But our little lemma is now very nice because the lemma tells us as long as we are only interested in valuing linear products of this index, we can just use the classical theory on forward rates, yeah? because the value of paying I at the end of the period is the same as paying L at the end of the period. So this little thing here is a bit important. Coming back to our picture, yeah? where is now the backward rate? So if I'm here in this interval from zero to two, then my backward rate 
Well, the expectation of the backward rate is just the same as the expectation of the forward rate. So it will be like the forward rate. When I have reached time t equals two, so now I have reached this time, then my forward rate is fixed, but the backward rate will go on. So the expectation of the backward rate is here at this starting point, and then it will move on. So I have some distribution of different backward rates, but taking the conditional expectation or taking the expectation of the values that have realized have been realized at the end will agree with the forward rate. So we have this little picture here. So what you have is that we observe the conditional expectation of the backward rate within the interval, say from S, so this is my, my S to T. Okay, and if the little T, the observation point here moves to the beginning, then we will agree with the forward rate. So you could say that you have some kind of a small short rate yeah, that runs inside this interval. Um, yeah, this somehow also completes the gap in the model. Yeah? For the discrete forward rates, you only have knowledge about these averages and you actually do not have the knowledge about what is going on inside these intervals. And this guy is now telling you what is going on inside these intervals. So if you go back to our definition of this accrual account, you know, the forward rates tell us here what is going on over such an interval. And the missing link is actually the stochastic of this short period bond. Yeah? So what is the bond doing that matures at the end of the period when I'm in the period, yeah, in the middle of the period. So this short period bond is creating here this stochasticity. Yeah, let's conclude my section on interest rates, defining the interest rates, and then we define interest rate products, products by a small remark on day count conventions. Well, when I defined the interest rate, okay, that was maybe not obvious to you, but then I used here T minus S. And maybe you are a physicist, you immediately think, okay, T, these are two time points, and the difference is a time interval, and it's completely clear how I measure time intervals in seconds. Yeah? But for a financial product, T and S is a date. Uh, and now think as a programmer, a date is an object that describes a day in your calendar. And it's maybe not immediately clear what is the difference T minus S. Okay, you would immediately think it's the number of days that have been passed, but then we would measure everything in days and we measure everything in years. Yeah? So it is an annualized interest rate. It is measured per year. and if you then measure this per year and you have leap years, uh, suddenly it becomes not so clear what this T minus S means. But now I'm a programmer and all I have to do is I have to define this operator here, namely the minus. I have to define the minus. What is T minus S for two date objects. And this should be a mapping that maps to R, yeah? the real world valued number or R in the units of years. And this is called the day count fraction or the year fraction. So for financial products, for interest rates, there are different conventions on how this factor here is calculated. Yeah? So how this 
um, interest rate period time is measured. So this map is a map that depends on the starting date and the end date on S and T, and it is called the day count convention. So now I look, I'm a bit lazy. Yeah, I do not want to write such complicated expressions here like they count fraction from s to t always on my slides so i just write t minus s but since i'm a programmer yeah this is easily understandable this is the operator they count fraction yeah operating on the two dates for historic reasons there are many different conventions yeah? and maybe sometimes this is also fooling people because they believe, okay, 5% interest rate, it's much more than 4.8% interest rate. But if the two interest rates are measured with respect to different day count conventions, maybe the smaller one is larger effectively because this factor here is a different one. So if you implement a valuation framework and you implement valuation of market instruments, you have to take care of this. For our mathematical theory, it's not so important. Huh? Just want to mention this for completeness. If you stumble across this, uh, you also find here in our little mathematical finance library some day count conventions. So there is here an interface yeah i have an interface so interface means i describe what functions do exist so there's a function that measures the difference the day count in days and then there is a function that measures the day count fraction the year fraction and maybe you can have a short look into this so this here is our library this is these source code with the different packages and somewhere here below you find time day count there is the interface which i just had on the slides so you have a function that gives you the number of days and the function that gives you the year fraction so this is my t minus s yeah? so one would be one year but one year in this convention and you see there are different implementations of this for example if you look here at actual actual uh, ista then you already see that this is yeah there's a java doc here this is a bit complicated calculations with some yeah checks if i have a leap year or not yeah so if you look here at the documentation actually it's a quite nice formula so um, you count the number of days that fall in a non-leap year, the number of days that fall in a leap year, and the day count is then, the, the, the year fraction is N1 divided by 3, uh, 65 plus N2 divided by 3, 66. And you have to be careful, yeah, is the starting date counted or the end date? The starting date is the one that counts, the end date is not the one that counts. So from 31st of December 2014 to one day later, uh, it is one divided by 366 because the first day was in the leap year. Okay, something like that. There are also some simple guys like 3360 where you just count the months with every month has 30 days yeah, and the year has 360 days a very simple formula then yeah but maybe not so accurate okay that was it for the interest rates